If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard in Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. What's up, everybody? This is the Pro Wrestle Zone podcast coming back at you with another exciting episode. And for the first time in probably a week, no, not even a week, probably four, four weeks, maybe a month, maybe a yeah. little bit over a month. It's been over a month. Myself, Dan the Beast, and the DVD Freak are continuing on with the 2002 WWE pay per view rundown. And uh, picking back up where we left off, we are here. We are at the King of the Ring that took place at the Nationwide Arena in Columbus, Ohio. Um, sometime in 2002, I believe the date was June 17th. June, 20, June 23rd. June 23rd. All right, a couple of days off. But, um, okay, so even a rundown of this pay-per-view, um, I think for the first time ever and i believe the only time ever oh first of all dvd yeah. wants to do a shot yeah i gotta do the shot of the uh let's see what we're drinking tonight i got me some gentleman jack i don't like whiskey but fuck it i'm a vodka guy but yeah here's well, to here's to maven's failed career <laughs> and as you can see ladies and gentlemen uh dvd freaks trying to stay somewhat sophisticated by drinking gentleman Jack Daniels whiskey. So, yes. Uh, you know, somebody got to keep it under control. I mean, it's usually me, but, you know. But anyway, um, going into this pay-per-view, I think for the first time and only time, I believe, um, the King of the Ring winner was promised a WWE title match at SummerSlam. I actually really like that because, you know, SummerSlam – is your second biggest pay-per-view of the year. And the main event, you know, should be not like nowadays. It's just kind of thrown together. Maybe you'll get a number one contenders match on raw or a battle Royal, but no King of the ring. That's a tournament. You know, it's high stakes. It actually made the tournament feel important. And it made that SummerSlam match legitimate by saying, yes, this is, the number one contender because he won the King of the Ring tournament, the most prestigious tournament in all of wrestling in 2002, at least. And, you know, it, like I said, it gave that importance, you know, nowadays we're lucky if we even get a tournament, if you do, it's just kind of for no reason. And referring to he, it was Brock Lesnar, who was the, um, the last King of the Ring tournament winner, um, for a long time, as this was the last um, King of the Ring pay-per-view, um, though we would never see the pay-per-view um, done again, the King of the Ring concept has been, you know, revisited um, a couple times throughout these past couple of years, as it was revived back in 2006. Um, I got the years written down here. 2008, 2010 with Sheamus. And I believe 2015, oh gosh, 2015. Uh, Wade Barrett. Wade Barrett, yeah, Wade Barrett. Yeah. And then obviously recently, uh, King Corbin. And um, I forgot so, that uh, even he's... happened. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot he won <laughs> King of the Ring. <laughs> we don't even watch the current product, so that's, uh, you know, that just blows proportions. But, you know, usually the King of the Ring concept nowadays is usually the purpose of giving a heel a gimmick. You give a, a boring heel a gimmick. Like, not saying that William Regal was boring because he was one hell of a technical athlete. Not saying Booker T was boring 
But what kind of gimmick did he need besides saying sucka, throwing up the five and doing a spin of Rooney and talking about Charmel without, you know, getting banged in the back by Kurt Angle? You know, but that's a different story. Um, but I think the concept of the King of the Ring tournament is good, but it's really well executed and frankly one of the worst pay-per-views of the year. Um, this year in particular. And this was around the time WWE was kind of going through like a turmoil only because of the name change. And they were just going through the process of, hey, you know, we have certain superstars on one brand. You want to catch these superstars, you have to catch them on SmackDown. You want to see these superstars, you have to catch them on Raw. And like I said, at the same time, you know, they got they got the F out, you know, which, you know, some of those commercials that they were airing, uh, they were pretty funny. They were making it seem like WWE was maturing. Oh, let's get the when mature you know let's get a let's give it a nice smooth cut you know give it that nice uh bowl cut you know but um obviously throughout the other half of 2002 it would get extremely better which me and dvd freak are very excited to uh you know we're we're getting close yeah i think once we reach vengeance once we reach vengeance well you know smooth sailing you know yeah, I mean, if you don't see Randy, if you don't see Randy Orton or John Cena on your pay per view list, it's not good. But um, anyway, <laughs> um, before I get into the match card, the intro, something that really bothered me about the intro into this pay per view. You're going through the years of every winner of the King of the Ring. You got 1993 with Bret Hart, 1994 with Owen Hart. You skip 95. Why are you skipping years if you're, you know, celebrating all these champions of the King of the Ring throughout the years? When did you want to acknowledge somebody like Mabel or, you know, the 98 or 99 was also skipped? You skipped Ken Shamrock. You skipped Billy Gunn. God forbid the guy was still in the company. At least acknowledge him, even though he's in this, you know, um, kind of a oddball tag team with Chucky and uh, Rico. But why is that? Um, I think Mabel, that's just one of those ones where Vince is like, you know what, that was garbage. So we're just going to, basically, they're just going to go through the illustrious winners. Ken Shamrock, I'm guessing because of his transition into MMA, uh, they just wanted to bury him, probably. But you know what, that wasn't even the point either, because by 2002, Ken Shamrock was with the TNA promotion. TNA had just started about this time. Yeah, well, maybe that's another reason. Yeah. Uh, I feel like they just wanted to bury him. And, and that, I, I mean, yeah, I, I do believe if you're going to explore history, you have to explore all of it, the good and the bad. And WWE is known for making their own continuity. So. Right. And, you know, so something else that, I believe is rarely even talked about nowadays is like prior to the King of the Ring pay-per-views, there was other King of the Ring tournaments that happened, you know, prior to, you know, the pay-per-views being established. Cause obviously the year before the first King of the Ring pay-per-view, Brad Hart had won the King of the Ring in 92. So why mm-hmm. not acknowledge like, Hey, Brad Hart's a former King of the Ring winner. You know, you had other guys like Harley race. I believe Ted DiBiase um, I believe Hacksaw Jim Duggan, if I'm not mistaken, and oh god, um, for some reason in my head I'm thinking Don Morocco, but I could be wrong. But obviously there was like, you know, the tournament was already well established by like, uh, like late '80s, I want to say, so. Beats me. Yeah, I mean, it's like uh, the Dark Royal Rumble matches. They don't really acknowledge those. So, And, you know, just going through the whole turmoil again um, throughout the whole first half of this year. Obviously, they had a big loss as it came to uh, losing Stone Cold, walking out of the company. Obviously, um... He was, I'm guessing Stone Cold was supposed to be a part of this pay-per-view, but until he found out, like, oh, you know, you got to put Brock over in a qualifying match, it's like, what? 
no, I'm not doing that. And that led to a predicament of, you know, somebody in Stanford, most likely Vince, picking up that phone. Hey, Rock, I know you're doing a movie, but uh, you think you could come back for like a couple months until we get things straightened out or at least get this new guy, you know, the gold around his waist. And obviously that led to another comeback, which nobody really thought he was going to have an in-ring comeback. And that was when Shawn Michaels returned to the company and going by this pay-per-view, I, I believe he was only back in the company uh, two weeks prior to this event. And even prior to this, he had like these uh, like these manager roles. He was like the commissioner at one point. Uh, he was involved in a couple of special guest referees matches in like 2000 uh, while still being aligned with DX. But um, this was really around the time they didn't really have that much star power. I mean, you had The Undertaker, but you really think Undertaker was really going to hold it for that long, knowing that Undertaker is practically injury prone by this point? And then you just brought back Hulk Hogan. Who wants to see a 100-year-old Hulk Hogan hold the belt for, like, five to six months? He couldn't even hold it for an entire month. <laughs> yeah, they, they, that whole, we've already ranted about this, but the whole Hulk Hogan title reign with the undisputed title, that was fucking worthless. My God. Right. Like, that, if you're going to have him hold it for a month, don't even do it. Oh, All right. So let's get into uh, one of these qualifying met or one of the semifinal matches here. Uh, we had Rob Van Dam, who was representing Monday Night Raw, versus Chris Jericho, who was representing uh, SmackDown at the time. And um, yeah, uh, this was, I thought the first half of this match was pretty bland. Uh, fortunately, it does build to something pretty enjoyable in the second half. Um, you know, I think RVD still seems to be finding his way in WWE at this point, as he was only in WWE for maybe like a good year now. And he had some pretty decent matches. Obviously, he had his battles, but like Jeff Hardy, um, he had that hardcore championship match with The Undertaker at Vengeance. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say he had the proper first WrestleMania opponent. Like I said, nothing against William Regal, but I would want to put somebody in RVD's caliber who can practically keep up with RVD. Because, you know, something that I've mentioned in the past before, you know, that word that keeps coming out of my mouth, Styles Clash. And obviously, you know, RVD has like the mixed martial arts background, um, with a lot of technical and high flying ability, as William Regal was, you know, he was that brawler. He came from the streets, but you know, he still has that technical wrestling ability where he's still able to get a hold of, you know, still get a hold of you in the ring. But um, and then the matches that he had with Eddie Guerrero, and I think over the course of the year, his performances have probably been a little bit disappointing um throughout the first half i would say with the exceptions of like some of the eddie guerrero matches but i think by the time and half comes around that's when he starts getting you know the proper pushes you know obviously he had like that match with undertaker wwe championship everybody thought rvd won oh rvd is a new wwe champion nope rick flair comes down his foot was on the rope Oh fuck you! You know what? Now what? What a great start that would have been. But obviously it was still early to be. But obviously, like going down the road, he would be in the first elimination chamber match. He would have a feud with Triple H for the World Heavyweight Championship, which has not been um, revealed yet, as we're still in the first portion. But um, you know, like I said, I mean, I think like the first half of the year for Van Dam had been pretty disappointing, um, particularly when you look at who his opponents have been. So I don't know what you think about that. Uh, I'm going to be in the minority here. I don't think he ever quite hit his potential in WWE. 
I can't name a five-star RVD match in WWE. Obviously, um, he missed WrestleMania 21. Uh, I think he missed WrestleMania. Was he at WrestleMania 20? I think he was in the tag match, right? The tag team turmoil match. Yeah, yeah. he was in the Smack. He was in the Raw. Um, F- the yeah, Fatal Four Way. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, he missed WrestleMania 21. You know, he came back big. He won Money in the Bank, and he had his moment in uh, 2006. And then um, obviously he was arrested. He had a bunch of problems. They took the belt off of him, and he never recovered. You know, his last feud was with Randy Orton in 2007, and they had a decent series of matches. Actually, my favorite RKO ever was, um, the, I think it was on Monday Night Raw, where um, RVD just sold it beautifully. That's my favorite RKO of all time. And then he came back in 2013, and it's just like, it was mainly pre-show matches. I think he took, you know, he faced uh, Del Rio, and... I mean, I don't think he ever hit his maximum potential, and I'm not really saying that's WWE's fault, and it's not RVD's fault. I think both parties kind of messed up on his his WWE run. I, I really wish right. we could have. I really wish we could have seen the ECW RVD, and I feel like we only really got that one time, and that was uh, him and Cena at One Night Stand. I think that was kind of the peak. And, you know, he only kind of went downhill from there. Right. And, you know, you can't necessarily blame WWE for, um, you know, his uh, downhill at the time in 2006. Because, obviously, his title reign was very short um, until, I believe, he was pulled over one day with possession of marijuana with Sabu. And that led to a big show. Um, defeating RVD for the ECW title, probably like a week later or so. Um, yeah, yeah. I think he, he yeah. only defend he only defended it once, right against Edge. Like that was it. Yeah, you know what? I think it might have been a. Oh, you know, yeah, the WWE Championship match. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yep. Because I think there was like a triple threat match on Raw between Van Dam, Cena, and Edge. I think it was either Raw or Vengeance. Uh, I, th- I thought Vengeance was just... I can look here. Uh, I thought that was just... Edge. I might be wrong, though. Let's see here. Yeah, it was uh, RVD versus Edge for the WWE Championship at Vengeance 2006. In a singles match. Okay. Now, why why is it, you know... I think this is a question that really stumbled my mind today. I mean, obviously, by the time you reach a certain standpoint in your career, like when you can officially say that you've made the big time, why is it that places like WWE, probably in particular WWE, withhold certain superstars from doing, you know, the moves that they were made for that made them big? Like, okay. why is this so limited? That's exactly the reason why. Because Vince doesn't want to admit that you made it big outside of WWE. To him, WWE is the be-all, end-all. Everything else is shit. That's in his mind. That's why he changes people's names. That's why he holds people's names. That's why he tries to trademark every little thing. It's because they make their own continuity. If it were up to him... WWE invented wrestling in like the 1800s and that's what it's been since that is Vince's in his mind that's what he wants to do sports entertainment that's his own little world and he wants to imagine that everyone there is his little puppets because you know you look at everyone in ECW like even nowadays like when everyone came from TNA most of them got thrown in NXT and they got buried to prove a point that they didn't make it, that they still had to pay their dues, even though they were big TNA stars. Look at Bobby Roode. I was pissed off about that one. Look at, look at Eric Young, you know, even Samoa Joe, he, he should have had a world title run, you know, and Nakamura. There's so many examples of established talent coming to WWE 
and they were just on main event. Like, Ricochet, I think he's on main event now. I mean, it's just... It's sad, and that's why I say WWE's death sentence. And whenever I see a report that a an indie wrestler is going to WWE, I'm like, well, you know, they had a good run. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was nice knowing uh, you. Now, now, nowadays, it's like good luck. You know, if this was maybe like four years ago, I don't initially think we would have that mindset because you really got to think of the people who were coming in like four years ago. You know, guys like Bobby Roode, Samoa Joe, AJ Styles, Shinsuke, um, Anderson and Gallows. I mean, out of that whole entourage, one of them actually made it. Well, why do you think? Why do you think that is? Why do you think AJ made it? Because of the ovation he got at the Rumble. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I think the only other reason too is because he made himself well established outside of TNA after he left. Because obviously he would go back to Ring of Honor and then he did some stints in Japan. So. Yeah. Which is probably my favorite version of AJ Styles personally. And I think he got over because of the huge pop that he got. He came in at number three. All you see is Roman Reigns' expression. That's all the camera was focusing on. You hear this music. You're probably sitting there thinking, who the fuck is this? You hear that huge pop, and all of a sudden, AJ Styles comes out. So whether you were there live or whether you were watching at home, he got over that night. And the fact that he was already in a championship match that same night because that Royal Rumble was for the WWE championship. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he made it decently far. Uh, I think he made it to probably like the last 10 people, maybe last 15. Like he didn't go crazy far, but yeah, it's always a shame because, you know, WWE, it's not to be all end all. Trust me. It's probably the worst place you could be right now. I I think I'd rather be wrestling in my backyard. Um, honestly, I'd rather wrestle for, not that I'm a wrestler, but let's say I am a wrestler. I'm the kind of person I'd rather make a hundred bucks a week and have a good time as opposed to make a thousand bucks a week and have a, a three minute match on main event that right. has to be so choreographed and so puppetry like that's what it is it's, i don't want to get into a wwe rant we're sp- we're supposed to be talking about the fun 2002 times all right right e- even though this is probably like the worst 2002 pay-per-view yes. um so after the match um lawler would go into the ring for an interview um he would ask rvd who he would rather face in the finals and rvd is just like whatever dude whether I face Lesnar, whether I face Test, whether I face Godzilla, whatever. And, you know, he tries to go for the RVD rant. Jericho attacks him from behind. And, you know, Jericho is basically just having a bitch fit. He's throwing on the walls of Jericho. You hear him screaming, I'm king of the world. I'm king of the world. Like, oh, oh okay. Like, we get it. No matter who I'm facing, regardless, I'm smoking a bowl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this was back before Jericho was a, a fucking 300 pound jack off. But anyway, what's the next match? Going into the second semifinals match, we had Brock Lesnar, who was representing Monday Night Raw, um, taking on Test, who was representing uh, Thursday Night SmackDown. And, um, you know, something. Before I even actually get into this, I feel like Test is the only one who seems out of place here Dude, within this whole tournament. <laughs> I thought the same thing. I was thinking to myself, who in the crowd thinks Test is going to win right now? Like, <laughs> I think this was kind of an obvious... I think once RVD won, they're like, okay, Brock's winning. Because it could have it could have been Jericho. I, you know, it, it looked very unlikely. But RVD sure as hell ain't winning. So I think at that point, the second match in here, I think it is pretty obvious Brock is going to win the entire thing. And right. it's just like, why why test? Like, that's just, at least put him up, put Brock up against someone that you're like, all right, maybe he will lose. 
You know, there were so many people you could have had them face. So it's just well, kind of ba- it baffles me. Potential. I think one of the potential opponents who it was supposed to be was Edge. And Edge wasn't a part of this King of the Ring pay-per-view due to him recovering from an injury that he suffered in the steel cage match against Kurt Angle. So. Yeah, he was out till after oh, 2000. July. Yeah. And then, obviously, yeah. he, he would go on to miss WrestleMania 19 and, and WrestleMania 20. He, he missed a chunk of time. Right. So, I, I think the build-up was definitely worth it, you know, two years uh, on a hiatus. But um, getting into this, um, Brock Lesnar um, moves on to the final. Um Quite a slow match, I would probably say. And there wasn't a lot to it. And I believe it was also difficult to see Test as a legitimate threat to Brock. Um, the finishing sequence with Test's, you know, big boot was quite good. But, you know, not awful, but nothing special, you know. Because you, you really got to look at Test's arsenal, you know. You know, all he had was like a big boot. He would do like a gunt wrench power bomb, and then he had a pump handle slam. And I really feel like this was one of the missed opportunities. Not saying that he was going to win King of the Ring, because obviously everybody knew it was going to Brock. You know, this was the this was the reign of Brock. You know, tour of two thousand two. And oh yeah. But the way I see it, it was like after Test won that, you know, that battle royal in two thousand one at Survivor Series. You know, not fired for a whole year. He couldn't get fired. I mean, couldn't you you at least build up to something? Yeah, and another problem I have with this match, uh, both semifinal matches were back-to-back. And then you had a huge, you had like two hours until the finals, or probably like an hour and 45 minutes. But um, I even have a huge complaint about the finals. We'll get to that. But, yeah, I felt like this could have been paced, but this didn't feel like a King of the Ring pay-per-view. You only had three King of the Ring matches out of nine. That's only one-third. What the hell? And I, I just really wish they would have put this maybe after after the Flair-Eddie Guerrero match, you know, just to kind of pace it a little better, but whatever. Right. Um. So... After this match, we would have a backstage segment. Um, Coach would go into the Raw locker room and, you know, get um, go into the Raw locker room to get their views on two Raw superstars making it into the, you know, King of the Ring finals. Like, all right, you got Raw superstars. Raw's looking dominant so far. And, you know, he would ask, you know, who do you think is going to win? Coach bumps into Bubba. Bubba's like, oh, you know, I would have loved to see an RVD. But he had no chance about against Brock, you know. Brock's a tough kid. And, you know, then, you know, Bubba, you know, wants to steal the limelight here, talking about, oh, I wish I was in the King of the Ring, going for a WWE Championship match at SummerSlam. Now, obviously, this was like the first failure of trying to push WWE, um, trying to push Bubba Ray as a singles competitor. And, you know what? It really never went anywhere after they split anyway, because as soon as they split the Dudley boys, they already aligned Spike up with Bubba. Because Vince yeah. already knew, like, oh, uh, yep, I fucked up. While you have Devon playing a pasture or Reverend on SmackDown, taking everybody's money, you know. <laughs> with uh, post, uh, post-AV or OVW Leviathan. Yeah, Deacon Batista. Oh, God. Um, but, yeah, this next match, I, I wanted to bring this up. We had Jamie Noble uh, with Nydia uh, versus the Hurricane for the Cruiserweight title. This match went 11 minutes and 38 seconds, and the only reason I stayed entertained was the commentary about JR living in a trailer. You had <laughs> This was King at his finest. Like, JR and the King had the perfect chemistry. And they're, yeah, they're talking about JR living in a trailer. He's talking about how ugly Nydia is. Like, this, like, honestly, you just kind of get lost in the commentary. This match is just okay. 
Um, you did have a really good neckbreaker spot off the top rope that actually popped the crowd. Uh, yeah. Crowd, that was probably that was one of the biggest pops of the night. And yeah, this was just like I said. Um, this match just felt out of place for me. I don't know about you. Just a bit. Um, but before going further into the match, I just want to give people here the backstory. So basically, the backstory here was Nydia, who was part of Tough Enough Season 2? Season... No. Season 1? I believe it was Season 1, because I think she won with uh, Maven. Uh, This was her debut, and she was known as the stalker ex-girlfriend of the Hurricane. And after finding her and his locker room, uh, Nydia had a new boyfriend. Uh, Jamie Noble obviously attacks the Hurricane. Uh, Noble would then be Kidman, thanks for an assist from Nydia, to become the number one contender leading into this match. Um, and the whole build, it's a really long promo on this show, I would say. Um, I mean, it's really hard to tell if they are trying to hype the Cruiserweight division or if they're just looking to kill time. Um, and obviously, during the duration of the story, um, Hurricane's mask was stolen. Uh, oh. Nydia was wearing them as lingerie. Uh, Hurricane would come out, I believe, like the last week before the King of the Ring pay per view, unmasked, choking, uh, choke slams, uh, Jamie Noble, you know, and that was practically, I believe that was probably like one of the last times we would see, uh, Helms unmasked until, uh, late 2005. But, um, yeah, like you said, I really feel like this match seemed so hard, out of place. And uh, this was Jamie Noble's um, pay-per-view debut in which he wins the Cruiserweight title in his debut pay-per-view match. And let me put it this way. Not a bad match, but the crowd weren't into it. And, you know, except that spot, I would say. And I think... Let me see. I think it was quite dull until the neckbreaker off the top rope. Um disappointing because i know that both men could perform at a lot a lot better and this was a big opportunity for both of them to do so uh i just don't really think they had chemistry yeah as the, you, there's times where two great performers just don't have chemistry together and i think this is the case but i don't want to get too off topic here but i am curious what are your thoughts on hurricane helms or gregory helms you know both characters uh favorite cruiserweight of all time okay um i i, I don't mention that but you know if, if somebody were to bring up like the cruiserweight division i mean i i would consider like gregory helms like one of the top guys i would um, I, I you know i always like the way he performed in the ring uh, technicality wise, I always felt like he could tell a great story. I always felt like whatever, I, I feel like whatever gimmick they gave him, he'll make it work. So yeah. like when they gave, like when they gave him the hurricane gimmick after a short run with the sugar Shane Helms, um, during the invasion storyline, it was like, he made it work. Uh, I, I think he felt a little bit out of place at first because during like that duration of his superhero character, he was teaming up with Lance Storm. Obviously, that was during the whole invasion storyline. But then later on, he would get his trusty sidekick, or I thought she was trusty, um, Mighty Molly, um, which led to a bad frying pan accident at the uh, oh, God. Uh, yeah. hardcore Mets. But overall, I mean, his career kind of dwindled down probably like those last two years as Hurricane Persona. But as soon as they made, you know, said, "Hey, turn heel," it was like boom. It was like right then and there, and he was basically the shining light of that 2006 uh, Royal Rumble uh, Invitational match. They basically had every who was in that match, who was a former Cruiserweight champion, participate in that match. But everybody was a SmackDown guy. Nobody was expecting a Raw guy take in that match because Gregory Helms was still a wrong guy at that point until he won the title. But overall, I, I, I've always loved Helms and I always found him a professional 
um, sophisticated comedian um, outside of the ring. Yeah. Um, I do follow him on Twitter and Instagram, and you know, he he always seems to be so engaging with his fans. But you know, in ring technicality, like probably one of the best to ever do it. Yeah, you know, I always compare him to like uh, Matt Bourne. You know, you're given a horrible character and you turn it into something that's liquid gold. You know, I love Heel Doink the Clown. I fucking love that. And I love Hurricane. You're like, if you told me, hey, you're going to be a superhero, I'm like, oh, goody. But you know what? He turned it into something great. He had um, a very memorable little program with The Rock. He was tag team champions with Kane. Um, and then, of course, he had Rosie, who was uh, Roman Reigns' father. little fun fact for a lot of people don't know that. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah. And uh, like you said, he was the face of that cruiserweight division, like 06 and, you know, very early 2007. He would even – wasn't he in a dark match at WrestleMania 23 with uh, Ric Flair and – Carlito and who was the other guy in that match? Oh, oh gosh! Um, I can actually I can look it up right here. <laughs> okay, let's see. I got the WrestleMania twenty three ten. Let's see. Let's see. But yeah, you know, it's um. I always thought it was unfortunate because I think nowadays a lot of people just see him as that Hardy's guy, you know, at the Hardy compound. Um, okay, yeah, it was Gregory Helms and Chavo versus Carlito and Ric Flair at WrestleMania 23, uh, the dark match. So, um, kind of an odd team up there, but that's kind right. of like the that's kind of the last time he was relevant in WWE. And then, you know, now you know he makes uh, his occasional cameo appearances, you know, at a Rumble or uh, at an AEW event. And, you know, he was a producer for a while. And if you're going to have a producer, you know, that's a guy that you want to have as a producer. And unfortunately, he was part of the Black Wednesday talent cuts back in, what, April. And uh, I, I guess he's kind of just floating around right now. I would love to see him take on a role in AEW, though. Um, let him be a manager. Why not? See what happens. Yeah. Um... I mean, let's see. I mean, he hasn't really been in too much in-ring competition or in-ring roles probably since his last stint in TNA, which was yeah. probably about 2006, maybe a little bit earlier than that. Yeah. But, boy, you know, we talked about oddball matches. Let's get into this next match because this oh, one was – very, very off. Like I feel like I'm watching WCW from 1999 again. Yep. You have Ric Flair taking on Eddie Guerrero. Now, prior to this, there was a backstage interview. Um, Eddie Guerrero basically just said that he was in his prime and he was going to send Flair to the retirement home. Nothing new there when it comes to fighting old guys, right? <laughs> but um, before we get into the detail of this match, um, this was something that I wanted to bring up earlier. Um, Eddie was supposed to be heading into a feud with Steve Austin um, during this time. Fuck me. However, <sighs> as I said, Austin walked out of the company um, after being unhappy with the uh, creative direction after refusing to lose to Lesnar, uh, which they were setting which they were setting him up for. Um, as such, they had to rush Eddie into something new, unfortunately, which. That's probably why it led to Guerrero and Benoit teaming up by that point. And um, Benoit and Eddie basically blamed Flair for Austin walking out. And so that's how the feud started. Also, um, with no Austin, I really feel like Flair had no reason to be a heel. Only because he lost a no-holds-barred match against Vince. For half of the ownership of WWE at, what, the 2002 Royal Rumble? Um, And thanks to Brock and Heyman, and Vince took back 100% of his ownership. Um, And then, you know, basically Flair claimed that he had one last run left in him as a wrestler. And this was right around the time 
Flair was losing his confidence. Flair was kind of just like floating around. He wasn't really feeling himself. You know, he's back in WWE, but he's not in that main role that he wants to be in. Which yeah. would lead to him, you know, obviously Triple H taking him under his wing. And uh, the rest is history. Um, <laughs> the rest is history going forward with that. Um, well, uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't see that nature boy until he was an evolution. And it was one of those things. Triple H, he told a story where uh, he saw Ric Flair just kind of like slumped over and catering. And he's like, that's my idol sitting there just, you know, kind of like perished, you know. So he really did help him become that limousine ride and son of a gun. You know, that nature boy, Ric Flair, when he was in evolution. And I don't think he really ever lost that um, until he got to TNA. But whatever. <laughs> but, um, you know what? I, I will have to say, um, given my whole analysis of this match, um, Flair put on a surprisingly good match here, I would say. And showed a lot more athleticism than he had in like other matches around this time. Um, Benoit would try to interfere in this match. Uh, referee would end up kicking Benoit out. All of a sudden, here comes Bubba. Bubba hits the, uh, I believe he hits a cutter on uh, Eddie. And basically, uh, Bubba just basically, or no, not Bubba, but uh, Flair Cross um, over to uh, cover Guerrero. And he picks up the win. And then we would see this little, uh, this is where you put on the uh, the little marathon music with uh, Bubba running into the crowd. and. Ben Watt chasing them. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, I believe N was great and they did their best to hide players' weaknesses um, at this stage of his career. Um, the finish didn't really do anybody any favors, but Flair had to win. And this basically set up a feud for Eddie and Benoit while allowing Flair to do so, you would say, because I believe the next pay per view, it led to. Benoit Guerrero versus Bob Spike. Yeah. Um, I, I believe that was, yeah. You want me to look? Um, yeah, it, it was Vengeance. So, yeah, that had to have been the, the next match. Uh, let's see here. We had, yeah, Bubba and Spike and then Benoit and Eddie. Tag team table match. Okay. Um, but, uh, here's a, I think I give this match a little more credit than most people would, because it did have storytelling that was centered around the figure four leg lock. Uh, you know, this match didn't have much of a purpose, so they kind of gave it a purpose. And you could almost say they overdid the whole figure four story, but yeah, you know, this was just... If you tell me Ric Flair and Eddie Guerrero are going to be in the same ring, I'm like, oh my god, fuck yeah. And this is just, it's a bland, it's just, it was a bland match that I think just happened at the wrong time. You know, it was kind of thrown in there because of Stone Cold, you know, obviously a lot changed for this pay-per-view. And it just felt off. It just did not need to be here. This could have happened on Monday Night Raw for all I care. Yeah, I mean, I could probably pretty much say the same. I mean, this was practically like a Nitro match that was on pay per view. Uh, yeah. Obviously, we would we would slowly start to see the rise of Guerrero's push in a way, even though he was floating around singles tag team competition at this point of his career. Um, but yeah, and speaking of Guerrero, uh, 15 years ago today, uh, Eddie Guerrero passed away. Well, shit, I think just for that, I need to put out the 10. There, there we go. We got the Eddie 10 in the background, even though you can't wow. fucking even. You can't. Oh, wait, no, I'll put it up here. Uh, yeah, I was seeing like posts about that and stuff, and yeah, it's um. 
just imagine I don't want to get off topic, but just imagine if he did survive. Because I think if he survived, Benoit also would have survived. You also have to take that into consideration. And wrestling hasn't really recovered since Benoit. And, you know, we were supposed to see Eddie and Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 22. Just imagine. Just imagine the match we would have gotten. That is the dream match of all dream matches right there. But, uh, yeah. Um... It's just it's depressing because he was sober, he was doing great, and look what happened. You know, it sucks. You know, his uh, demons from the past caught up to him. Um, but the one, the way I kind of look at it is, at least we had the best Eddie Guerrero we could have possibly had in his final days. Yeah, and, and, and who knows? Probably going into twenty two, if he would have survived, we probably would have got a you know a better version of that. So. Oh, yeah. Him and Sean, I would have hoped Eddie would have went over, but I doubt it. But, yeah, that's just – that's one of those matches we can only uh, think about. Okay. So, going into our women's title match, we had uh, Trish Stratus taking on Molly Holly. Um, going into this, um, Molly had beat Trish in a singles match uh, two weeks prior. Um, on Monday Night Raw uh, to earn this title shot. And after the match, she choked Trish out with Trish's underwear. So that was like, oh, that's very nice. That might uh, be a pri- I, that, that's a privilege to some people. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. But um, the, the way this was, this was practically the deplorable storyline where they made out Molly Holly was you know fat and had a big ass and this goes on throughout the whole match with the you know the commentators you know talking about whether molly had considered uh liposuction etc um horrible things to say and molly is actually a perfectly healthy weight and very attractive i would probably say it's Uh, it's like Mickey. It's like Mickey James. Remember the whole Piggy James storyline? Yeah. It's just. It's just stupid. I don't like when they put body shaming into a storyline. It's just to <laughs> me. It's just the weakest. Like that's all you could come up with. Really? That's it. To laugh at the commentary for this because when Molly was setting up for her Molly go round finisher or whatever, and missed it. JR is practically like, oh, I think she broke a two by four <laughs> when she landed out of her ass. <laughs> oh, my dude. That, <laughs> yikes. Oh. Yeah. But um, you know, Molly goes for the Molly go round, and but Trish, uh, Trish dodges. Uh, she rolls Molly into a pinning predicament, but Molly counters and grabs the tights to pick up the win. Uh, Molly Holly is the new women's champion. Um. Like I said, deplorable storylines aside, uh, Molly Holly can really go in the ring, especially around this time. Um, This was not the best display from these two, I would say, um, with some minor mistakes, but it was reasonable, solid uh, overall. Uh, The finish was kind of disappointing, but it was nice to see, you know, Molly, you know, get down for the winning, you know, winning the belt here. Yeah, normally this would be like a dream match. Uh, Molly Holly, she's terribly underrated. Uh, She's passionate. Uh, She wanted to be on WrestleMania 20 so bad that she offered to shave her head. Like, that just shows you how much she wanted to be a part of everything. And it kind of sucks that she's not remembered more. Like, to me... The Hall of Fame's a crock of shit, but I think she deserves it more than Sonny, more than Ivory, more than Tori Wilson, more than the fucking Bellas, for fuck's sake. Um, Oh, my God. You know, if anyone deserves to be in the Hall of Fame, it's Molly Holly. I think she is phenomenal. And she's still got it, too. Like, uh, I remember when she made an appearance in the Rumble a few years ago. I think it was 2018. Oh, my God, dude. She was one of the most talented people there. She had the mom haircut, like she's driving a minivan to the arena, but you know what? She can kick some ass and she can still go. She could probably kick a few soccer balls too. 
Oh, and, hell yeah. Uh, I, I believe I, she also made an appearance in this past Royal Rumble as Mighty Molly. So, uh, that was that was a that was a pretty treat, I believe. I, I believe it was a past rumble, but I could be mistaken. Yeah, it was nineteen or twenty. I'm not sure. I uh, I blocked out 2019. That was a horrible fucking rumble. But uh, oh gosh, let's get into the uh, <laughs> the next match. We had uh, Hulk Hogan taking oh, on. Oh god. Kurt. I'll tell you what though. How many times have you seen Hulk Hogan tap out? Not too often. This was putting Kurt Angle over, man. This is a clean finish. I, look, I'm a huge Kurt Angle fan. Um, I'm not a fan of the whole toupee and the little wrestling garment. But you know what? This is actually one of the few times you saw him in wrestling, um, like a wrestling uh, without like the singlet. Right. Uh, you had him in the little Speedo. So that was interesting. And... It was just kind of, this was a joke, but at the same time, if you think about it, this was huge. He made Hulk Hogan tap. That's the equivalent of making The Undertaker tap. I can't think of a time in WWF slash E that Hulk Hogan ever tapped out. Clean. Um, I did like the finish, the little skirmish. Um, They were going back and forth. You know, Hogan was reversing the ankle lock over and over again. He grabbed the ropes but then Kurt Angle pulled him away. You know, you're legit just like, oh, my God, what's going to happen? And I loved how you went to – you had the transition reversal uh, from the leg drop to the ankle lock. That was awesome. Like, I I dug the hell out of the finish. It's just – you know me, I don't like comedic wrestling. So, you know, he rips the little toupee off his head. The crowd has a laugh. I, I just don't like that. Kurt Angle, to me, that's like doing that to Benoit. Like, it's a, one of the greatest technical wrestlers of all time. So it pains me to see this comedic spot. But at the same time, he made Hogan tap. And that's big. That's really big. Yeah. Um, I mean, terrible for the time that they tried to pretend that this was a real competitive wrestling match. Uh, the lead-up to the finish was quite fun. And I would say probably good to see Hogan uh, put over Angle clean with the submission victory, too. Um, the right result, I would say, and yeah, you know, this was this was the battle between two American heroes, as you know, the interview that was conducted earlier before this match. Um, but honestly, this match was basically led from you know Hulk Hogan was going to retire. Hulk Hogan came down to the ring and he was like, "Oh, I'm going to retire, yada yada." But you know, this was. This wasn't about Kurt Angle, I would say. This was more about the lead-up to fighting Mr. McMahon. Well, I think the next time we'd see him wrestle was No Way Out 2003, right? Against The Rock? Pay-per-view-wise? Um, well, I know he was at the Vengeance pay-per-view because he teamed up with Edge against Billy and Chuck. And then I believe... Oh, yeah. After- yeah, you're right. Yep. And then after he basically got destroyed by Lesnar, um, yeah, that was pretty much the next time we would see Hogan. Uh, He faced Rock for the second time at No Way Out. Uh, This led to the whole fucking special referee with Savon Grenier as a SmackDown referee. Vince screwed him over. These guys finally had a street fight, which was probably, that was an epic street fight. I I I am not going to lie about that. WrestleMania 19 is my all-time favorite pay-per-view, and I might be a little biased, but that might be my favorite street fight as well. And you have to look at it this way. Like, let's say we're alive back in 1985, the first WrestleMania. Did you ever think you'd see the day that Vince McMahon would face Hulk Hogan in a street fight at the 19th WrestleMania? Come on. Like, that's kind of... It, it sounds retarded at, in the 80s, but it actually happened, you know, in 2003. So it's almost like a punchline to a joke, but it worked really well. You know, it's, um, I, I love that match. And then you have the random Roddy Piper cameo, but whatever. Oh, God. That was, yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, 
We are now here for the uh, the King of the Ring finals. We have Brock Lesnar taking on Rob Van Dam. <sighs> um, you know what? I um, this was a solid match for its length, but this was pretty short as it was just probably over five minutes. Five and minutes and also, forty-four seconds. Ugh. Also. If we were trying to sell that RVD's back was injured going into this match, that, you know, that didn't come off at all. And no. he didn't even sell the back work done by Lesnar, really, I would say. But obviously, we already knew. I think fans were pretty much smart enough at this point on who was going to win this King of the Ring. Yeah. Pretty self explanatory. I, I think it's embarrassing. That you have the final. Not only did you have two semifinals back to back, just to kind of get them out of the way in the beginning of the show, but you have a five minute final match. Uh uh. It's called King of the Ring for a reason. That should be your main event. You know what? Fuck the main event, Undertaker and Triple H. That was dog shit. That's one of the. Oh my God. You easily could have. Reduce that 10 minutes, make it make that match 13 minutes, and make this one 15 minutes. Easily. That's all you had to do, because the main event was 23 minutes long for some god-awful reason. And this is one of the yeah. exceptions. This is one of the exceptions where the title should not go on last. It's called King of the Ring, for fuck's sake. Put the King of the Ring finals in the main event. Or don't call it King of the Ring. That's like having a Hell in a Cell pay-per-view without the Hell in a Cell being in the main event. Oh, my God. Yeah. This, this pissed me off, man. Now, you want to talk about Pointless. Yeah. This, before going into this match, we probably had the most pointless backstage segment. Uh, Triple H heads to the ring for the main event, and he walks into Shawn Michaels who returned to WWE as a manager for the NWO. Obviously, they look at each other, look like they're about to face off, give each other a hug, you know, because friends don't shake oh. hands. Brothers got a hug, you know. Yeah. Uh, That's you know not they harsh. have to stare down, and, uh, you know, Nash turns up. Um, you know, they embrace, you know, X-Pac, Sean, um, and then you have Big Show, which, you know, he just kind of gives them that nod, like, What's up, Paul? Like, yeah, you know, we're not really cool, but whatever. And, you yeah, know, I Nash wishes him luck. Oh, yeah. I, w I wonder why Scott Hall wasn't there for the little quick reunion. Uh, you know <laughs> what? I, 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 you know <laughs> what? Storyline-wise, story I think that would have been a lot more reasonable instead of having Big Show in that lineup. Like, if yeah. all four, like, if all five of them, all five of them were backstage, this storyline probably would have made a lot more sense. But, you know, yeah. Nash puts his luck, you know, you know, getting the belt and everything, and then they follow up with, hey, if you need us out there, throw it up, we're here for you, buddy. Which, that never fucking happened. No, so, it's like, it's foreshadowing for a story that never happened. Yeah. You know? So that was pretty much <laughs> it. But anyway, going on to the main event of the evening here. Um, we had The Undertaker, who was WWE champion at this time, taking on Triple H. And uh, during this, uh, Paul Heyman joins JR and King on commentary as Brock Lesnar now has first dibs for the WWE championship as he is the 2002 King of the Ring winner. And he... Um, advances into the you know the WWE championship match at SummerSlam. And obviously Rock is involved with this too because during another segment he said, Oh, I'm gonna be keeping my eye on the Undisputed Championship match, you know, obviously foreshadowing something there. Yeah. Um okay. Let's put it this way. <laughs> this was a poor main event. You know, the way I see it, WrestleMania 17 proved that these two could put on a great match together, but nothing even close to that level that was reached here. 
and uh, Triple H and Taker just half-ass a match until, you know, Rock comes down and, you know, all the shenanigans um, ensue that really don't lead us anywhere in the end. Uh, the Rock didn't really add anything to the match, and his whole involvement was extremely um, just pointless, I would probably just say. Um, why did he even bother to run down to the ring and chase Paul Hank? You know, why did Undertaker feel the need to deliver a big boot to him when it hurt his chances of retaining the Undisputed Championship? Okay, let me put this into perspective for you. Uh, I'm not everyone is a Dave Meltzer fan, but I am. Um, he gave this match a half a star. Do you know how bad you have to do in a pay per view main event to have a half a star? And this, these are the same people, Undertaker and Triple H at WrestleMania 27, who had. Like a four and a half star match. What the hell happened? I'm gonna quote you. What are you doing? Like this is just like what the fuck are you doing out there? Like this is complete horseshit. I watched. Uh, I I wanted to fall asleep watching this. I. Uh, it's 2002. We've seen some of the greatest pay per views and matches of all time in 2002. So what the fuck right did this have having half a star and i don't disagree this was an awful main event this was shit my fucking dog could go outside and take a shit and i could microwave it and it would smell better than this match did this was awful well i mean since you have a cat i don't really think that works i i have two dogs at my mother's house okay i grew up with dogs not cats all right (laughs) All right, fine. I'll go to anyway. the letter- All right, no, I'll go to the litter box, pick up a piece of shit, microwave it, and there you go. Th- that'll taste and smell better than this. Oh gosh. Okay. Um. Anyway, back to uh, topic of discussion here. Um. Honestly, this was honestly this whole match was practically just the build up to Rock's return and his title match at Vengeance the following month. Which was well, great. Uh, yeah. It, you know what? That was a good triple threat match. I am not going to oh, lie about that. Yeah. That, that pay-per-view, let alone, was stellar, which we will begin into um, in our next episode of this series. Can but I- going into the conclusion of you know this whole pay-per-view, this was a pretty disappointing show. Now... Growing up as a fan, as a kid, you know, obviously these are memories that are going to be engraved in our minds for the rest of our lives. But back then, it was like, oh, you know, this is cool as shit. You know, like 2002 was the year. The rosters were stacked. And this was a new era of WWF slash E as everything was going on. But, you know, despite this being a pretty disappointing show. The mood can't have the mood couldn't have been too great either here with you know Austin who had walked out just prior to this event. Um, all right, here's the pros. Uh, you know, I did write some pros and I did write some cons here. <laughs> Gee, uh, which pros, one? I, I I wonder which list is longer. Okay, so well, <sighs> mm, okay. <laughs> Well, the pros here, the opener, uh, Jericho RVD. It was actually the best match on the card. I agree. Um, It's decent, but perfectly passable, which kind of sums up the show, really. Brock wins the king of the ring. That actually had some meaning as he gets a title shot at SummerSlam. Um, Angle was put over by Hogan by submission, though the match wasn't up to, you know, wasn't up too much. Um, and Molly wins a well-deserved women's title. Here are my cons. The match quality on this card is pretty low, and there is certainly no match worth um, going out of your way to see. 
Brock wins the King of the Ring without really showcasing his true talent. He destroyed Van Dam in five minutes. The main event is confusing, shambles, with nobody really putting any great effort in. There's no point of having that whole NWO segment with Kevin Nash and the rest of the NWO with Triple H talking about, hey, bro, if you need us out there, just throw it up. He never even threw it up. And God forbid, you, you know, you had Locke's involvement in this match, but doing what? Just, you know, he just basically, he's just there for show. He's basically just there for rating because Austin's not there. And obviously that's the reason why he's at this pay-per-view because they're bringing him back to hold the title for just one month. Do you know how funny it would have been if Triple H held up the fucking click sign and then you see Kevin Nash running down and he tears his quad halfway down the ring? Well, I mean, <laughs> he, was, he was pretty close to tearing it anyway. I mean, he would only tear it next month. <laughs> yeah. So it would have been, uh, it, it, you know what? It, it would have been right then and there, which probably would have made the pay per view a lot more disasterful. Entertaining. Or, I hate Kevin Nash, so that's good. Oh, uh, God. Who knows where that would have led? Because that practically just led nowhere. Like, if you weren't going to have a segment, like, or at least some type of um, segment during the match where the NWO shows up, get rid of that whole backstage segment altogether. Okay. That was pointless. I have a mini rant to go on. Uh, here we go. <sighs> All right. So a lot of people may disagree. I'm not a fan of squash matches. Um, I personally believe... Hear me out. That let's say you have RVD and Brock Lesnar in a 25 minute competitive match, and Brock Lesnar comes out on top. I would personally think that makes him look better than him having a five minute squash match. Because you have to look at it this way a competitive match, whoever that winner is, it's going to elevate them. Because you're like, holy shit, they just won this complete war between their opponents. That will not only put them over with the crowd, but as well as, you know, make them a believer in him. If you have a squash match, the crowd's just going to be like, oh, all right, that's cool, I guess. So RVD and Brock Lesnar, that match on paper sounds amazing. So there is no excuse that this should have went five minutes. That is complete bullshit. Fuck whoever decided that. Because that should have been a great match. I would pay to see that right now to this day. Um, you know, I love Brock Lesnar and I love RVD. Sorry, I do love Brock Lesnar. I do. He's a, he's a very intelligent person in terms of the wrestling business when he wants to be. Oh. I was going to say, well, you ain't, you ain't missing much because they would face each other again at the uh, Vengeance pay-per-view. Yeah, but it's just this, uh, not only is this a King of the Ring finals match, but this is a also a number one contenders match. Don't make it five minutes. This right. is a double, this is a double whammy. This is the kind of thing you want to make an Iron Man match or a fucking two out of three falls match. Not some fucking five minute shit. Like, fuck you. Like this honestly Oh, my God. No wonder King of the Ring went away. No wonder. This is bullshit. Fuck this. I hate this pay-per-view. Okay. I, I do. Well, you know, uh, technically, the King of the Ring pay-per-view was supposed to return next at the next year, but uh, ended up becoming or renaming uh, Bad Blood. Yeah, if you actually look on some of the early pay-per-view inserts of 2003, it does say King of the Ring was supposed to happen. Yeah, so that's uh, that would have been interesting, but obviously I don't, we understand I'm, the whole bad. I'm glad it died. I'll tell you what, the Monday night. All right, Raw, so 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 you know what? Leading to this question, if they were to have had a 2003 King of the Ring, one, who do you think the winner would be? And two, would the same 
um, stimulations, do you think they would have had the same stimulations at this pay-per-view, you know, going on to a main event match at SummerSlam? You mean stipulations? Stipulations, yes, <laughs> that, that's what I was. Uh, they're not stimulating each other. Holy shit. This thing, yeah. Right. I, uh, <laughs> oh, whoops. Um, I think Benoit is the obvious winner. But because look at it this way, uh, this would have been June 2003. I think Benoit would have been a perfect choice. And then you have him. I don't think you should have made it a number one contenders match. Make that into the build to WrestleMania. You know, you have him win King of the Ring in 2003. He wins the four Rumble and then he wins the main event of WrestleMania. It's the perfect build. I think that would have made the most sense. I mean, who else would there have been? I could, I could honestly see uh, them doing like, sh- I could honestly see him doing Shawn Michaels, but yeah, that's what I have to say about that. The only other man I probably would have saw, because obviously he had that one tenure in WWE, and that was Goldberg. Oh no! Don't say Dad. that. I'm sorry. Well, oh. You know, at least we got the uh, second elimination chamber match. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, you, um, yeah, I, I was very happy, but um, we all know that's my least favorite yeah. wrestler of all time. Right. Yep. Same here. I, you know what? I can't complain. Can't complain about that. But um, all right. So going into this, uh, even though they took the belt away from Hogan, giving it to Taker. Did nothing to improve the quality of the main event match here. Nope. Um, what's disappointing for me about this is, you know, the time period is that we see people doing great stuff, but in the undercard. So, like, people like Angle, Edge, you know, Guerrero, um, you know, just people of that caliber. And then... For clear, you know, for clear reason in the main event, we have extremely disappointing matches from guys like Hogan and Undertaker, whose title runs seem to be based more on nostalgia and tenure rather than wrestling ability. Um, on the positive side, we did have some positive change coming. Um, Brock Lesnar's push was coming. Um, to the four, and The Rock returned uh, to be the guy who eventually passed the strap at SummerSlam, um, with obvious reasons, as we just discussed earlier um, in the show. Now, giving it a grade. All right, here we go, Willie J. You know, great time. Yours is oh, going to be boy. better than you know mine. I, All right, I, I'm actually going to write this down. You know, I've never done this, but I'm actually going to write it down here. Uh, oh man, hmm. I I would, but I don't have anything available. Actually, I have a sharpie. What can I write this on? All right, you know what? Here's what we'll do. We'll write it at the same time and show it, so we can't be influenced by the other person's choice. Wait, 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 wait! Don't show it yet. Okay. You... All right, okay. hold on. <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Um, all right, we'll write it on. All right, you ready? Yeah. Three, two, one. I gave it a D. I gave it a D plus ick, which stands for dick. All right, that's fair enough. (laughs) Now, the only reason why I gave it a D plus was because, obviously, some of the storytelling. Obviously, this had, you know, some reasoning for watching, you know, watching this pay-per-view. Obviously, you said double whammy. Not only would the person win the King of the Ring tournament, but they're going on to face the WWE champion at SummerSlam. Um, and then, obviously, the other positives that I mentioned um, in this show before. Um, Molly, again, her well-deserved women's title match victory, winning the women's championship. Uh, the opening match that had a, you know, a slow, bland build, but obviously it picked on, uh, picked up uh, later throughout the match. And then, obviously, Brock winning King of the Ring, which, uh, like I said, you, you don't have to be, you know, a smart wrestling fan to know, like, hey, 
Brock's not winning because he did. So. <sighs> yeah, this is a. Uh, to me, this is the worst pay per view of 2002. And it's actually very interesting how you go from this to Vengeance 2002 because that pay per view, it's just like this. I've always said you have to get to the bottom to get to the top. And we are about to get to the top in the best way possible. So, you know, we're building up to SummerSlam, which to me is probably the best pay per view they've ever put on. So I'm excited. Yeah, and obviously we would see more progressed storytelling, I guess you would say, because obviously the NWO story didn't work out. That ended up fading away as soon as uh, Kevin Nash uh, tore up at uh, one of the Monday Night Raw episodes. It was a 10-man tag, and it was, I don't, I, I can't even recall the participants, but I know Kevin tore his quad. Vince came out the next week in the NWO music, and he was like, oh, the NWO is no more. And that's when we were introduced to Eric Bischoff, which led to possibly one of the greatest eras in WWE that, you know, yes. that second half of 2004. And Mafia. then obviously we would see um, the return of, Sh- of Shawn Michaels in in ring competition, which I wasn't the biggest Shawn Michaels fan, but it was always good. He always did good storytelling. That was the one thing I always appreciated about Shawn Michaels. His storytelling, uh, whether it was verbally or physically, you know, he always knew how to put on, you know, a good show. Um, And we would bear witness to the first ever Elimination Chamber match at Survivor Series. Which is another one of the greatest pay-per-views of all time. So it's interesting. If you ask me what the best SummerSlam is, I say 2002, hands down. And what the best Survivor Series is, 2002. And um, I know a few people that will say WrestleMania 18 is the greatest WrestleMania of all time. I I don't think so. But, you know, are you... No. Um, I say 19. But 18 is definitely top 10 for me. Um. It's just, this period of 2002 is just, you know, the only reason I'm still doing this is because we are about to get to something great. No Mercy is my favorite B pay-per-view of all time. No Mercy 2002. That is just gold. And, you know, I uh, I can't wait. It's going to be cool. All right, guys. So... We're about to wrap things up here uh, with this episode. So let's give out our uh, our social media information, Freak. Uh, the next place you can find me is at the AA meeting down the street. But um, yeah. other than that, the DVD Freak on YouTube, and then Instagram and Twitter at the DVD Freak, Snapchat, fuck you, JJ, you made me do it. But um, uh, the DVD Freak, I think... I don't know. Um, um, I'm actually pretty active on Snapchat. So, you know, that's probably the number one way to contact me at this point. So maybe JJ did some good in the world. He made me uh, my antisocial self, made me a little more accessible. And then, of course, uh, the Wrestling DVD Room on Facebook. Um, We're a little over 600 people now. So, um, yeah, that's... I only vision that to be like a hundred people. So now that we're over 600, that's awesome. So, you know, it's going great. I thank everyone for that. And, uh, that's about it. And you can also find me on all forms of social media, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, now you can officially find me on Snapchat, which I can probably account JJ for. Um, thank you, JJ for bringing me back for like the third fucking time. Cheers. And uh, of course, you can find me on YouTube at the end of Beast 94. So be sure to hit that subscribe button, especially if you're going to be watching my videos and you're not subscribed. What are you doing? Hit that button and be sure to subscribe to the Pro Wrestle Zone podcast. This is the end of Beast 94 along with the TV. You guys have a good night.